อารหังสัมมาสัมพุทโธภคาวานพุทธังภคาวันตังอภิวาเทมิสวานข้าอนโตภคาวตาธรรมโมธรรมังนามสามิสุปฏิปันโนภคาวโตสาวกสังโฆสังขังนามามินะโมตัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนะโมตัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนะโมตัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะสกุลอัปตนุนเอฟริวันโอเคสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดีครับทุกท่านสวัสดี Many things that we we need to learn, we need to know, we need to prepare ourselves to be a good monk. I believe at the initial phase of your monk's life, okay, in the first three years, if you have the right structure, the right training, it will help you to lay down a good foundation to be a better person, to be a better monk, okay, to have more understanding about the authentic teaching of the Buddha. So that is why you know the first three years to five years we are called Navaka. n a w a k a means newly ordained monks. So basically, we have two main duty. The first one is to study the teaching of the Buddha. You know, of course, the teaching of the Buddha is kept in the Buddhist text, right? And it's our job to somehow. I know it's difficult to study the Buddhist text. So my job is to get you, okay, to get to know the sutra or the discourses of the Buddha. Just to show you real quick, this is the Buddhist text. This is the Buddhist scripture. You see how thick of the book. Okay, this is in Thai. There are 45 books of this in Thai t i p i t a k a It's very thick. This is just one of them. We're talking about 45 of this, plus another 45 books as a commentary, which is handbook of this one. So altogether, it's like 90 books, you know, for us to study. So to me, uh, this is a precious gift of the Buddha, even though he passed away a long time ago. But as long as his teaching still exists, and we Have a chance to access to that teaching and put the teaching that we learn into practice. Then, there is a possibility that our mind can be liberated, our mind can be pure and bright, just like the Buddha and the wise men in the past. Even though we may not get to that level, just like they did, but have access to the teaching of of the Buddha and put into the right practice can help us to live good life. Whether we continue being a monk or we have to go back to be a layman, so that's something you should keep in mind. We will continue what we left off from last week. We start off with this sutra, right? As a new monk, your job is to get to know how the Buddha trained the monks, what kind of expectation that Buddha wants the new monks to learn, and to behave according to his teaching. There are many teachings that the Buddha talk about uh, someone becoming a good monk or how he trained the ascetic, trained the monks back then. I put everything together in this particular lecture from last week and this week. For the new monk to see the the broadest picture of how the Buddha trained the monk, and I found out that Mahasapura Sutra, which is in the m a s h i m a Nikaya, the middle length discourse of the Buddha, number thirty nine. This is um, it gives us like the the pretty much you know the overview of how good monk should be, what kind of expectation that the Buddha you know uh, laid out you know for the new monk to train themselves. To me, I feel like doesn't matter how long we ordain, we have to follow this. This is like the the blueprints of the monk should train themselves from day one that he become a monk until the day that he achieves nibbana. So it's not just for the newly ordained monk. You just come to this monastic journey. I think it's a very good start for you to get to know this particular sutra. So you see like the whole blueprints, you know, from the bird eye view. See step one until the last step of how the Buddha wants you to be trained. We are here at Mahasapura Sutra, okay, and uh, also. 
combined with the Kanaka Mokalana Sutra, which is another sutra that the Buddha suggests monk to be trained from step 1, step 2, step 3, step 4, step 5, step 6, and onward. But there are similarity of these two sutra. That's why uh, I put them together. So, so you guys can see you know, both of them at the same time, and then it gives you um, much better understanding of how the monk should be trained. Again, the essence of this sutra, okay, what make good monks? That's the question that new monk or old monk should ask oneself all the time. What make a man to be a good monk? What make good monk to be a better monk? What make a better monk to be the best monk? So this is the question. I think it's essential for us to keep asking ourselves for the question like this. So we can kind of reflect on that of why we become a monk and how monk should behave, how monk should train oneself. We have uh, hover up until number five from last week, right? Hope you still remember. Start from Hiri Otapa. That's the first step. Okay? When someone comes to the doctrine of the Buddha, the Buddha will mention this framework first. Make sure the monk understands what it means by Hiri, which is you know, the sense of shame, and Otapa, which is fear of wrongdoing. Right? And from there, he starts introduce the second step, which is you know what? Keep your body, speech, and mind pure. And move to the second, the third step, you know, pure in livelihood. We need to know what monks, what kind of livelihood, consider right livelihood as a monk. Okay, how can we obtain food? How can we obtain clothes? How can we obtain shelter and medicine properly as a good Buddhist monk? And then move to the next step, which is you know, control the sense base of what we see, what we hear, what we smell, what we taste, what we touch, and what we think. The other one is moderate in eating. You see, the step go like this. It go like this, from the easier one to the most difficult one. Start from observe precept, right? Pure speech, pure body, pure thinking. Obtain necessity in the right manner, which is called right livelihood. And, you know, learn how to control your sense, okay? And learn how to manage the way you consuming food, right? Consuming clothes, consuming shelter, consuming medicine. And that's, you know, what we talk about on the first part of this lecture. So today we will finish the rest, number 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, hopefully. <laughs> Just hang in there. As I mentioned, there will be a lot of text. Study Sutra, that's the way it is. It's, it's not fun, it's not, there's no picture, there's nothing excitement, but it's all pure knowledge that kept in the letter. So our job is to understand it and decode the meaning behind each sentence or each word vocabulary that, that we have read. All right, so let's move on to number 6. After the monk, you know, feel comfortable with eating, he you know what to eat, he you know when to eat, he you know how much should he eat, and he feel very comfortable with that. And you know, the Buddha said, uh, "Is there anything else, or am I am I done with the monastic training?" The Buddha said, "No, there are something else for you to master. After you comfortable with all of those, you know, with hiri otapa, with purity in conduct, you know, body, speech, and mind, with pure livelihood." with sense control and with moderation in eating. What is something more? The Buddha said, okay, this is the next step. If you are ready, let's move on to the next step. And the next step is called practice wakefulness. What is practice wakefulness? Let's take a look from the, uh, the text itself first and then to see if we can understand what the, the meaning behind you know, this uh, sentence. When practicing walking and sitting meditation by day, you see day here, uh, night here and the time of getting up here. So wakefulness means opposite to laziness. That means you have to be diligent. You cannot be lazy. Good monk should be wakeful, okay? not lazy. When practice walking and sitting meditation by day, we will purify our mind from obstacle. Okay? Obstacle may refer to the hindrances, which we will get to that in a moment. What, whatever consider obstacle that's stopping you from going back to the cushions, from going back to the meditation room, and that's something you need to work on. When it's time to meditate, you go meditate. In the evening, we will continue to practice walking meditation and sitting meditation. During the day, you sit, right? You walk and then you sit during the day. And in the evening, again, you walk and then you sit again. Two times already. And in... Uh, in the middle of the night, we will lie down, you see, lie down in the lion's posture, 
this is something new. This is something new, new vocabulary today. We will lie down, that means we 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 about to go to bed, right? But this is the way monks go to bed. <laughs> lie down in the lie on posture. Okay, on the right side, placing one foot on top of the other and stay mindful and stay aware. And focus on the time of getting up. This is a lie on position. This is how the Buddha and the Arahant monks, they, this is how they go to bed. They don't just lie down just like us, you know, just, you know, head touch the pillow and, and fall asleep right away. This is how they stay uh, internal awake. The body need rest, the mind also need rest. But when, when the Buddha and the Arahant, when they go to bed, they sleep with consciousness. Human being, when we sleep, we lost conscious. We don't know what's going on. We completely shut off. But not with the Buddha and those around. When they sleep, they, they are fully conscious. There's no defilement in their mind. They may sleep a few hours, but they will wake up fresh because their mind is always uh, at the state of peace and calm all the time. Now you see the picture. But you don't have to do this. When you go to bed, you go to bed normally, but you stay conscious and remind yourself before you allow yourself to fall asleep that you know what, the body needs rest. I will go to bed now, it's 10 o'clock, and I will wake up when my body is ready, maybe 4 o'clock in the morning, maybe 6 o'clock in the morning. You remind yourself that when it's time, that alarm clock ring, I will wake up and continue practice meditation. And that's the idea. Some monk wake up in the middle of the night from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., start walking meditation back and forth, back and forth. Okay, and 3 a.m., you know, go for morning chanting and do another round of walking meditation and then get ready for the arms round. You need to find a way to adapt yourself to the concept of you know, wakefulness. This is mean what focus on the time of getting up. Okay, So you, you remind yourself that the body needs rest. I'm going, I'm going to sleep. I'm going to rest my body. But when I'm done, I will get up right away, fix my bed, go brush my teeth, get rest, and go for the morning meditation or morning chanting, whatever waiting for you in the morning. So you prepare yourself for your training before you go to bed and in the last part of the night in the last part of the night we will get up and continue practice walking meditation and sitting meditation again purify our mind from obstacle obstacle can be anything right can be hindrances can be defilements can be laziness you name it so if you were to study this particular dhamma by yourself from the buddhist text how much do you understand is there anything makes sense to you? Anything doesn't make sense to you? I want you to feel that. Because one day, I encourage you to go back to the authentic teaching, to this sutra or some other sutra by yourself. Uh, I already sent the, um, the uh, Buddhist text in English version where you stay. I believe it's in the office. So feel free to take a look. Okay, Just open it up get the feeling out of it, you know, read some of them, or you know, just, 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 just open it up, okay? smell them, read them, feel them, feel the wisdom of the Buddha that kept in those books. And if you have any question, again, write down the question and ask me when you have time. And this, is, this is what it said right in the text about being wakeful, wakefulness. To keep it simple, that means you don't be lazy in practice meditation. The keyword here you see all the time is about sitting or walking meditation. Day, evening, late night, early morning, during the day. So four or five times a day that the Buddha mentioned here that the monk should continue practice meditation. Whatever meditation object that you learn from your teacher. The Buddha did not give one technique to all students. When someone uh, approached the Buddha and asked for his SY, he will give a specific meditation object to each individual. Some monk, he give walking meditation. Some monk, he point to, you know what, you should reflect on the dead body. You go there, meditate there, and then you become successful. Some monk, the Buddha introduced anapanasati, or practice breathing meditation. He did not give one technique to all students. And now your job as a new monk, you come to learn meditation and practice meditation. It's your job to explore the technique that works for you and cultivate that, develop that without being a lazy person. And that's the idea behind this you know, particular uh, paragraph that we just read together.
and the next step the buddha move on after you you can call yourself i'm not a lazy person i practice meditation every day either walking sitting okay i go to bed at 10 i wake up at 4 sometimes i wake up in the middle of the night when when i wake up i will not go to back i will not go back to bed again i'm just con- i just gonna continue practice meditation by myself sometimes in a meditation room sometimes down the um, uh, down the road where you can find the the trees you know the stone or the cave somewhere that you can meditate by yourself so you have achieved that you know that you're not a lazy person and now you come to the buddha the buddha what is the next step and this is the one this is the next step now it's time for you to advance your practice with sati and sampachanya i hope you still remember that okay. mindfulness and awareness is sati right awareness is sampachanya i will uh, explain a little bit okay in a moment let's take a look at the text first it said how is a monk mindful it's when a monk meditate by observing okay it when what when a monk meditate by observing an aspect of the body anything else the feeling the mind and the mind object keen aware and mindful okay get rid of desire and aversion for the whole world they meditate observing okay the aspect of four thing body feeling mind my object which point to what still remember sati patthana sati patthana the four foundation of mindfulness there are four area where we can practice mindfulness or where we can cultivate mindfulness or in other words where we train ourselves to be mindful mindful of the body mindful of the feeling mindful of the mind or the thinking and mindful of the mind object what come into your mind and there will be uh, the lecture on the satipatthana later on okay for now just get to know the term and understand what the buddha means by practice mindfulness so in this sutra he did not explain in detail about satipatthana but he point to four thing four area where you should cultivate mindfulness sati is something in front of you but sati and sampachanya is very really close okay so let's take a look then you see the difference how is monk consider aware of sampachanya this is everything sampachanya mean knowing knowing what you do is when a monk acts with full awareness with full awareness or clear comprehension full awareness mean clear comprehension you know 100% what happening in the body right now are you walking are you sitting are you eating or you you know doing laundry you know exactly 100% when going out when coming back when looking ahead when look aside when bending when extending the limbs when bearing outer robes bow and ropes when eating when drinking chewing testing urinating defecating <laughs> everything when walking standing sitting sleeping okay waking up speaking and keeping silent that is how a monk is aware see this is the buddha word this is how he explained to the monk what he means by sampachanya what he mean by aware or comprehension okay but in this part is only the body part the buddha did not explain the feeling the mind the mind object in this particular sutra so when we come to the sutta study we cannot rely on one sutra to understand the whole picture sometimes it take several sutra to get to see oh this is what the buddha mean but for now we just going to stick with this sutra and i'll try to fulfill some of the missing point or help you to connect the dot so when you go back to study you know where to look for more information by yourself what we learned so far we learn mindfulness and we learn awareness according to this particular sutra right the buddha trained the monk after you comfortable with what moderation in eating with wakefulness practice you're not a lazy person now you come to the next step which is more advanced more difficult about being mindful about being aware of every single thing that you do the moment you wake up until the time that you go back to bed sounds simple but it's not easy the buddha said now be cool you might think we have achieved monastic training already we have hiri otapa right 
we develop our bodily, verbal, and mental behavior is pure. Our livelihood is pure. We can control the sense door, and we don't eat too much. We are moderating in eating, and we also dedicated to wakefulness. We also have mindfulness, okay, and awareness. That should be enough. <laughs> no, the Buddha said no. There are something else, okay. But before we move on, let's recap. About these two things again, because this is very important, and it will help you to meditate much better if you understand how to practice sati and sampachanya. Utilize these two elements to help you to have a good or a better concentration when it's time for you to close your eye, you can sit back and trying to still your mind. Sati, I'm sorry, sati and yeah, sati and sampachanya is called the two virtue of great assistance. Okay. With these two things, we can master any kind of dhamma much better. But without these two things, it's going to be hard for us to practice or study or apply any kind of dhamma that we learn, because we will not be at the present moment. Our mind will be everywhere. Sati give us the sense of what sati is like the cage, right? If you want to study something, study the bird. The bird always fly here and there. We cannot study the bird while it's flying. So our job is to catch that bird, in put the bird into the cage, and that's the duty of sati. Sati is to grab it, whatever object you want to study. You grab it, you put into the cage, and then you use sampachanya. Sampachanya is like the eyes. Now it's time for you to take a look, to see, to understand, to study whatever you want. What kind of bird? What color? How many? You know uh, how many color the bird has. You know what what size. You know whatever it is. This is the duty of sampachanya. So sati and sampachanya has to support each other, and then samadhi can be happening. Once everything is in place, then we can concentrate. We can fully concentrate on the object of our meditation, with the breath, with the walking meditation, with the mantra, with the visualization. Whatever meditation object or med meditation method that you use, okay, which is called samadhi or samatha. Again, this is concentration. And sampachanya has a nickname called integrating wisdom. It help integrate, integrate what? Integrate sati and integrate samadhi together. Sati, catch right, catch what? Catch what in front of us. If we are using breathing meditation, sati catch the breath. Where the breath, you know, uh, traveling in and out. Usually, we focus our attention where the breath touch the um, around the nose area, around this area. You, we can feel that when we breathe in and out, we notice that the the air will touch around this area. So we place our attention here. So sati is grabbing the breath here. You know. When you breathe in, you know the 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 air go through this. You know, uh, uh, start from here, go into your body, and when you breathe out, you know that sati, sati grab, and then you know that the breath come out this way. So in, you know, out, you know, you breathe in long, you know, you breathe in long, you breathe out long, you know, you breathe out long, you breathe in short, you know, you breathe in short, you breathe out short, you know, you breathe out short, you know it's here. This is called sati, and when you don't know. That means you lost conscious. You lost sati. You don't know, you know how long, how short of my breath. You don't know where the breath is. That means you lost conscious already. So your job is to start over again, bring sati back, look at your breath. Where is the breath going in, and where is the breath coming out, and start from there. Breathe in again, breathe out again, and this cause sati. And when sati is there, now your sampachanya telling you, oh, okay, now I see, I start seeing that the breath coming through my nose. Go to my throat, down to my chest, down to my uh, uh, lung, and all the way to the center of the body. I know I breathe in long. I know I breathe out long. I know I breathe in short. I know I breathe out short. You see, sati and sampachanya work together like this. And once you know you breathe in, breathe out, long or short, then you can stay concentrate. Your meditation will be much better. That's why it's called integrating wisdom. All right. And the next step, what is the next step after you comfortable with that? Okay, you understand you're not a lazy person. You practice, you know, um, uh, sati and sampachanya, right? 
the Buddha point out like this: What more is there to do? Take a bhikkhu, okay, to the secluded lodging. Okay, the Buddha point you to, you know what? Now you are ready. You're not a lazy person. I believe you, and you know how to be mindful and to be aware of what you, whatever meditation object that I suggest you to practice. I know you can know. I know you can do it. Now it's time for you to put everything you learn into practice. Now please go find yourself a secluded place, meditate by yourself. Okay, where? Into the forest, into the root of trees, to the hill, the top of the hill. Okay, to the mountain, to the cave. Okay, to wherever. Okay, the open air in the cave or the heap of straw. So basically, he suggests you to meditate. Okay, meditate alone. Meditate alone, because back then um, there was no, not many temple or meditation school where you can stay there and learn with many students. When you meet the Buddha, the Buddha may stay that in that town for a few weeks and then he move on to another town, right? So when he train you, he will give you the meditation object. Once he know that you are ready, he give you meditation object and he point you now. You know what? Let's Put everything you learn from me into practice. Just help yourself. Go find a quiet place, the conducive place to practice meditation. Okay, but again, when you study by yourself, when you study sutra, you need to imagine yourself back to the Buddha time. You cannot just follow something you read exactly one hundred percent. If you come to this sentence, you said, "Oh, this is what the Buddha said." So now it's time for me to go get lost in the wood and practice meditation. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to do that, okay? There are many factors involved in order for you to be success in meditation. Here, this is the environment in the Buddha time. This is how the monk live. This is how the people live back then. But in this 21st century, there are many places where you can practice meditation, more conducive in meditation practice, right? The place where there is no noise. If it's hot, we have air conditioning room. We have the room with soundproof, where it's very quiet, so you can sit there with the nice temperature, with with the not too dark and not too not too bright. Everything is under control. Then when you walk into the meditation room, you are ready to meditate without worry about anything. And when you finish morning meditation, there will be food for you on the night at uh, on the table at the dining table. You don't have to worry about going find food, but You know the monk back then; they have to take care of themselves. Pretty much everything. If you stay in the forest, you must know how to survive in the forest. If you stay in the cave, there is no toilet, there is no clean water, there is no food. But you must make sure that you survive. Okay. So when you study, this is the beauty of study Buddhist text. You have to Im- imagine the real environment back then. Okay. The time that the Buddha gave this particular teaching to this particular group of the monk. All right, and apply to your uh, present moment uh, wherever you are. If you go back to your country, a different environment. Now you're in Thailand, and you're in the training again. It's another tra- it's another training environment as well. And the next step, which is again more difficult than the previous one, is called hindrances. This may be new to you. What it mean by hindrances? What are they, and what do they do, and how can we get rid of them? Okay, let's start from the meaning first. Hindrance to keep it simple, hindrance is another name of defilements or kilesa or mental impurities. It's a mental factor that hinder, hinder what you will progress in meditation and in our daily life. It's stopping us from making progress in meditation. It's stopping us from having a clear thought and clear mind, and that's the generic idea of the word hindrances. There are five of them, which the Buddha mentioned in many places throughout the Buddhist text. As a meditator or student who come to learn how to meditate, this is something you must know. You must be prepared. These are your enemy. When you sit down, close your eye, try to still your mind, you will be encountering something called five hindrances. Whatever meditation technique that you are practicing, all right. So now you're comfortable with wakefulness. You're not a lazy person. You master mindfulness and awareness already. You're comfortable. Now you go find a place to meditate, according to the Buddha's suggestion. Okay. So you let's say you found a place. 
<laughs> you found the beautiful tree, you found the cave, the quiet place. In our case, we have meditation room. <laughs> we have a beautiful meditation room. Now you can sit anywhere, anytime you want. No problem. But no matter where you sit, you will be encountering these five enemies or the five hindrances. So let's take a look. So after the meal, they return from arms round. Okay, you see? The monks come back from the arms round. The monks sit down. After he finished the meal, okay? The meal from where? The meal from arms round. So monk wake up in the morning, practice meditation, and go to the village to do what? To get food, right? To, to go arms round, he get food, he come back. He may sit at the um, somewhere, okay, underneath the tree or the cave, the empty hut. Once he sit and finish his meal, right away, right away, he sit cross-legged with his body erect and establish mindfulness right there. So basically, when, when, when the monk finish eating, he do nothing but just go back to meditate right away. Okay, and that's what the, that's the typical situation of how the monk back then practiced med meditation. Giving up desire for the world. Desire is another name for tanha, right? Or thirst or craving. They meditate with a heart rid of desire. They meditate with a heart rid of desire, cleansing the mind of desire, giving up ill will. Okay, this is number one of hindrance. This is number two, okay, which is ill will and malevolence. Malevolence. They meditate again with the mind, get rid of ill will, okay, full of compassion for all living beings, cleansing the mind of ill will. Okay, that's number two. And number three of hindrance is giving up dullness and drowsiness. Okay, number three. Okay, we go through. The we will go through the text together first. And then I'll come back and explain each one of them in a moment. They meditate with my rid of dullness. Okay, the my get rid of dullness and drowsiness, perceiving light, mindful, and aware, cleansing the mind of dullness and drowsiness. That's number three, and number four. He giving up something called restlessness and remorse. Okay, utaja kukuja in Pali, restlessness and remorse. They meditate without restlessness. Their mind is at peace inside, cleansing the mind of restlessness and remorse. And number five is called Tao. He giving up Tao. They meditate having gone beyond Tao, not undecided about skillful qualities, cleansing the mind of Tao. Okay, and that's how the text how the text explains the meaning of hindrances. So if we come to this teaching for the first time, again, we may get confused. We may have a hard time to okay, understand what it means. So study Buddhist, Buddhist text. Again, we sometimes we need someone to guide us, and we need some experience. Okay, This is good. You just ordained for the first month. You have come this far. You should feel grateful for that. Usually, many monks don't have a chance to study like this. Okay, People ordain with no structure. They ordain by themselves. Okay, people, the temple give you the hut. You stay by yourself. There's a food over there, meditation hall over there, toilet over there. So help yourself. Thirty day, three months doesn't matter. But here in this training, we have the structure for you, and you have come this far to get to the authentic teaching of the Buddha that kept in the Buddhist text. Even though you may get confused, you something like look very new to you. It's okay. To me, I feel grateful for this because when I first ordained like you guys, I don't have a chance like this at all. Okay, I wish I had go back in time and have someone teach me 15 years ago. All right, now we have come to this. Okay, even though we may not understand, it's okay. Just hear them out. Uh, have this information somewhere in your head. Okay, and go back to relearn by yourself later on. Jot down something you and you don't understand. Or jot down something you want to study more, and help yourself. There is a Buddhist text that already there in Suksawang. All right. Okay, this is what it said, right? So let's take a look. So I give you a summary. There are five of them when we meditate, and this five enemy is called 
are called hindrances. There are five of them that mentioned from this text, but now we're going to zoom in each one of them. Uh, this is to make it easier. There are five of them. Start from number one. It's called Kama Chantha in Pali. Don't worry about the Pali term. The reason I mentioned because when you go back to study by yourself, you will come across this keyword in the Buddhist text. So at least you know you 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 have a chance to see it, to hear the pronunciation, to get a chance to familiar with the word first. But the meaning, it's okay. Okay, uh, we can slowly understand it together. So the first one of hindrance is called kama chantha, kama chantha or sense desire. Kama chantha is not just a sexual activity. It's everything that comes through your sense that entertain you. What you see, what you hear, the, the beautiful sound, the music, right? What you taste, the, the tasty food, delicious ice cream, okay? The smell of the perfume of your, of your choice, the clothes that you wear that give you comfort of the body. Anything at all that gives you pleasure through this five sense door is called Kama Shantha. Okay? Sometimes it includes the mind as well. You think of something you like, you don't think of something you don't like. You keep on entertaining yourself through that thought. <laughs> okay? So, and that's, the, that's number one. Ask yourself, when you meditate this morning, how many times did your mind go after something like this? Go after the same pleasure. Something that you see and you like it. Something that you hear and you like it. Something that's happening to you in the morning when you come to the meditation room. Those things keep bothering you. And this is called Kama Shantha or Sen Desire. It distracts our mind from, from being still, from your meditation object. Okay? <coughs> and it's called Kama Shantha, Sen Desire. And the second thing, the second enemy in meditation is called Payabhat. In Pali, Payabhat in Pali, or ill will, okay, or resentment, okay, all the way down to anger. You're not feeling good, you don't like anything. All of a sudden, you feel pain, and then you get annoyed, get agitated, and you want to quit meditation. I don't want to do anything because today I don't, I'm not feeling good for some reason. So it's called Payabhat or ill will, ill will. And number three is called slot and torpor. Pali called tina mitha. Okay. Tina means sleepiness. Okay. Mitha means drowsiness. You don't feel fresh. You feel sad. You feel unhappy for some reason. You have no willpower to do anything. That's the idea of mitha. Okay. Tina is about sleepy. Maybe you don't have enough rest. Okay. Maybe you wake up too early. So when you meditate in the late morning session, you fall asleep. And this is one of the hindrances that always take you off from your meditation object. How many times that you fall asleep during your meditation? What happened in the early morning when you meditate at 5 o'clock? How many times that you can stay awake? How many percent that you stay awake? What about late morning? Afternoon, evening, or late night, about 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock at night, when you go to meditate at the meditation room, we tend to fall asleep, right? And this sleepiness is one of the hindrances that we need to keep in mind okay, as a good meditator. And then we can, we can do something about it. Okay? Don't allow yourself to fall asleep every time you sit. That is not a good sign. Once it's become a habit, it's very difficult to remove. It's very difficult to fix it. All right, and number four is called Uttaccha Kukkutcha. Uttaccha Kukkutcha. <laughs> Today, there are many, many new words, okay, including Pali and English vocabulary. It's a good, we come here to learn, right? So uh, slowly learning and understanding uh, together. Later on, you can come back and relearn, okay? This video will be recorded and, you know, you can go back to it anytime uh, in the future. Uh, Uttaccha Kukkutcha. Uttaccha means restlessness, okay? Kukkutcha means worry, or sometimes we call remorse. Which is guilt. Okay. Feel worried, feel guilty of something, agitated, non-stop. 
so the mind cannot meditate well the mind cannot be still because the thought keep on coming start from little thing until something big you may worry about oh you know uh, maybe someone in this room have covid infected so i'm i'm meditating with them i'm afraid i'm going to get infected by covid 19 as well so you just thinking something you know all of a sudden think of covid 19 and all of a sudden you feel like oh it's time for lunch maybe i should quit now you know should get ready for lunch something like that <laughs> so it restlessness it keep on thinking and human being we spend 47% of our time on the daily basis get lost in thought according to the Harvard study. This is very interesting. That means we're not really at the present moment. Our mind is always here and there, not here and now. It's here and there. It's think of the past. It's think of the future. It's think of things that you know happened long time ago. It's think of something that will not be able to be happening. See, almost 50% of our daily life the time that we spend, we get lost in thought. And wandering mind or wandering thought is not a healthy mind at all. As a Buddhist monk, we meditate a lot. Our job is to master this, make sure that we can still our mind every time we meditate. So today, you can still your mind maybe 5% in that one hour. It's okay. Learn what went wrong, what went well, what worked, what doesn't work. What kind of hindrances that bothering you today? Or bothering you this session and now the next session you are prepared okay last session I fall asleep so this session okay I will not fall asleep I will drink enough water I will do some stretch up first I will do something to make sure I sit comfortably but at the same time not falling asleep okay so you reflect on your practice this is how you can make progress in your meditation all right so uh, this number is quite interesting almost 50% we get lost in thought, which is not a good sign at all. And number five is doubt or vichikicha. Vichikicha means you are not sure. Okay, You have doubt, you are curious about your own practice, your own inner experience. When you close your eye, you meditate. You visualize the object of your choice and all of a sudden you have thinking that, oh, is this object real or is it just my imagination? Or is this experience real or it's just my thinking or I just make it up? This is called doubt. You have doubt with your technique. Is that technique work or should I change it? Whatever it is, when you have doubt, you cannot go further in your meditation. You should stop. Okay, Step back and take a look what's happening now. What should I do? The easiest way to get out of doubt is to ask for, seek for advice. Ask your meditation. Teacher, ask your meditation tutoring team. Check with them. Don't be, I have this issue. I have stress in my around my eyebrow every time I meditate, and I don't know how to get rid of it. Ask them. I always fall asleep after 10-15 minutes all the time. How can I fix this? Ask them. Okay. Or every 30 minutes, when my mind about to be still, there are always some thoughts coming up. My mind go after the thought all the time. And then I get lost in thought for 10 minutes and come back again. So it happened every single time that I sit. Again, ask them. <laughs> okay, Everything has solution. You need to uh, take responsibility to seek for advice. Don't keep it. Don't hold it. Don't keep doubt in your mind. It doesn't do any good. So all of these five hindrances, there is a reason for them to show up. And there is a way to deal with each one of them. Okay? That's a good news, right? <clears throat> to summarize, hindrance. So I spend more time on this because we meditate a lot. And every time we meditate, we will be seeing this guy, one of these guys, several of these guys. Or some of you experience all of these guys at one session. That's something huge, something big. Something that all meditator should be prepared, okay, should be prepared and keep in mind and prepare for that, how to deal with it. Craving mind, okay, karma chantha, the mind that never stop wanting, go after something it like from what you see, what you hear, what you smell, what you taste, what you touch, what you think. And that's called karma chantha. 
Second kind of mind or hindrance is angry mind. You don't like it. You get agitated for some reason. Maybe today you're supposed to meditate at 9.30 and all of a sudden there is no electricity. You cannot turn on air conditioning. So you don't like it. You sit and complain. I don't like it. It's too hot here. I want to quit. You see? You see the nature of your mind. It's come from where? It's come from Payabad. It's come from this defilement. From, from this mental, it's come from this mental impurity called Payabad. Following by number three, sleepy mind. Tina Mitha, not feeling fresh, no energy, toward laziness. <laughs> Maybe after lunch and you go meditate. This is usually happening because we having food in our stomach and we try to meditate. So the body digests the food while the mind try to stay awake. So that's quite challenging. All right. And number four is wandering mind, Uttacha Kukucha. The mind keep on thinking non-stop for some reason, okay? And the last one, Vichikicha or doubtful mind. You have doubt in your practice, you have doubt in your technique, you have doubt in your teacher. Whatever it is, don't hold it, don't keep it. Get rid of it, seek for advice, okay? So, um... These are the five hindrances, and there are a reason why they show up when we meditate. In another sutra, the Buddha talk about food for food of hindrances. Okay, food of hindrances. Number one, what cause sense desire? Sense desire come from attraction. You start from something you like. It start from liking first. When you feel like you like something, that's the red flag telling you that this is karma shantha. Send desire happened already because you like it. Like what? You like the food, you like the music, you like the room, you like the people, you like the new iPhone. It starts from liking first. It goes from there. So when you like something, the mind will go after that thing. And when you close your eye, the mind don't want to come back. Don't want to stay still because it's go after something it like. You see them before you come to the meditation room, and when you sit in that room, your mind is still outside because the mind go after what it like. That's the nature of the mind. You will. What cause you will? Okay, repulsive or I like to use the simple word like you dislike. It start from the feeling of I don't like it. You don't have to be mad or get angry okay that's already beyond you know uh, you're out of control already so you get mad already you lost conscious already but it starts from something simple something minor like i don't like it it's hot today i don't want to meditate there's no air con today because no electricity i don't want to go to meditate today there is no uh, teaching monk okay there is no food whatever it is there is no favorite food you expect someone to offer the food that you like, but today that person don't show up. So you don't have that food that you want to eat. So you get agitated. You don't like it. And when you don't like it, that feeling stay in your mind. When you go to the meditation room, when you go meditate, you still have that feeling, negative feeling all the time. And your mind start wondering. But it starts from here. Then you want to quit. I don't want to meditate. You're done for that session. You see? And the third one, okay, downness, okay, no energy, sleepiness. Okay. There are many reasons for that, right? Some people don't like exercise. Some people eat too much and go meditate. So it causes you to fall asleep, right? Uh, you need to exercise, okay? If, you, if you're lazy to exercise, then most likely you tend to feeling unfresh and tend to fall asleep, okay? Drowsiness after the meal, that's understandable, okay? The sluggishness of the mind. That's understandable as well. Uh, another one, okay. What caused you to be worried? Okay, unsettled mind. That means we're not mindful. We're not mindful of what comes into our mind. Whatever we see, smell, hear, and touch, whatever it is, it comes with feeling. Whether you like it, you don't like it, or you feel neutral. And that feeling. Okay, got us thinking non-stop. The mind cannot be settled. 
thinking, thinking, thinking. So our job is to understand the cycle of your own thought and stop it. Okay. When you see, you just see. You see, we talk about sense control. The Buddha already prepared us long time ago, right? In the very first stage about controlling your sense, right? So we talk about hiri otapa, purity of conduct. Uh, right livelihood and then sense control and number four the state number four the Buddha already teach us and prepare us for the sense control but when it's come to the later step okay when we talk about hindrances if you already master sense control then these five hindrances you know um, cannot harm you cannot bothering you too much because you already have that foundation laid out you know a while ago and Dao, okay, Dao come from careless attention. That means you not pay attention of the technique that you use. You not thoroughly understand the technique. That's why it doesn't work. If you use breathing meditation, do you really know how many steps in breathing meditation? What is the step number one? What is the step number two? Okay, how many steps? We're talking about not just one, two, three, four, five. We're talking about 16 steps. 16 steps mentioned in Anapanasati Sutra. This is how we practice meditation, breathing meditation. It's not just one step, you see. So we need to uh, study the technique thoroughly, carefully, until we fully understand, then we put into practice. And when we have doubt, again, just simply ask, seek for advice, ask questions to your teacher and your teaching monk. Okay, so prepare for that. So this guy will come, one of these, several of these. Morning, you may face a certain hindrances. Af afternoon or evening, you may face different different form of hindrances. Okay, so whatever show up, okay, your job is to study and find some tool to deal with them. All right? And now we have come to the last two steps, <clears throat> which is the jhana and the higher knowledge. Okay? I will not explain in detail about these two factors because it's considered an advance. It's going to be confusing if we spend a lot of time on this. So in these two lectures from last week and this week, my intention is to open up your eyes of to know and to understand how the Buddha trained the new monk and what consider good monks. Somehow, these two elements also a part of this, according to the teaching of the Buddha. So that is why we need to get to know them, we need to see the term, we need to get the feeling what they are, but we may not spend a lot of time on this, on the, the last two parts, okay? Because it's quite time consuming and there are many sutras that talk about this as well. So today, let's just get to know them get the feeling, and then uh, we go from there. The, sec the next step, the Buddha talk about something called the jhana. Again, welcome to the new term. Okay, We learned something new uh, with this sutra. Many new vocabulary today. After okay, the monk give up the five hindrances, so step by step. Now you know five hindrances. Now you remove them all. And what happened after five hindrances have been removed? This is what happening. It's called the jhana. Corruption of the heart, weakened wisdom. Okay, this is the name of hindrances. Then quiet, secluded from sense pleasure. No sense pleasure. Unskillful qualities. They enter the, the remain of the first absorption. Absorption is jhana. English used the word absorption, but the Pali used the term jhanas. The first absorption, which has the rapture, what is rapture? Rapture is piti in Pali. Piti in Pali translate to rapture. <laughs> and bliss in English, which is come from the word sukha in Pali. The original Buddhist text, okay, the language used is Pali. And then get translated to English, to Chinese, to some other languages later on. So when we have doubt, we need to go back and check from the Pali canon, check from the authentic vocabulary that used in the Pali canon. And the text used piti and sukha. Piti translates to rapture, okay, feeling good, feeling bliss, feeling joy. And the sukha also, you know, blissful happiness. Okay. When you read different books from different translators, you 
don't have to be surprised that people use different vocabulary based on their understanding and their experience. They may feel like this English vocabulary work best for this particular Pali term. So in this in this uh, in this um, sutra, the translator translate the word piti to rapture, and translate the word sukha to bliss. Okay, so we're gonna stick with this. The first absorption or the first jhana has rapture and bliss born of seclusion, while placing the mind and keep it connected. They drench, stiff, fill, and spread their body with rapture and bliss born of seclusion. There is no part of the body that is not spread with rapture and bliss born of seclusion. Do you understand what you just read? <laughs> what you just heard? <laughs> okay. Again, this is quite advanced. Okay, dhamma topic when we talk about jhana, when we talk about, you know, uh, the higher knowledge. So, in this teaching, the Buddha trying to explain the monk what will be happening after five hindrances have been removed. You will experience something called the jhana. But he did not explain a lot, as you can see. That's all of the explanation of this particular teaching, right? So what is it? Okay, the first jhana here, that's the keyword. And what kind of, uh, the, what the characteristic of the first jhana? Oh, okay, there will be rapture and there will be bliss. That means when someone attain the first jhana, you will have these two, uh, you will be experiencing these two feelings feeling of rapture and feeling of bliss. That's the indicator telling you that you have reached that level, the first absorption or the first jhana. Okay, according to this particular uh, uh, text, uh, according to this particular teaching. So there is no part of the body that is not spread with rapture and bliss. When a person achieves the jhana state, every single cell, every single part is his body filled with happiness and joy. So they cannot fall asleep. Their consciousness will be there 100% with happy mind, happy body, relaxed body, relaxed mind, fully. There is no part of the body. That means no part of the body from the top of your head to the feet to the tip of your toe. You feel bliss, you feel rapture, you feel joy, 100%. You see, this is the beauty of jhana, right? So when we get to the advanced meditation, we will encounter something like this. It's called the jhana. And there are four levels of jhana. By the way, if someone asks you what is the jhana, the jhana refer to the meditative state where the mind is profoundly what? Still and perfect concentration. Super still. Perfect concentration. The mind not move. The mind not get distracted with sense desire, with ill will, with sleepiness, with thought or doubt. No such thing at all perfectly still and perfectly concentrate. The mind is fully immersed in an ab uh, and absorbed, absorbed by whatever object one chosen to focus on. That's why it's called absorption. That's why it's called absorption because you and your meditation object become one. Let's say you use the breathing meditation, you and your breath become one. You feel like you are unified with your breath. You feel bliss, you feel joy, every single part of your body. Super still, super peaceful, and super focused or concentrate. The mind feel very happy, no distract, and you want to be there forever. Okay, that's, that's the idea. And jhana is considered to be a key okay, in Buddhist, uh, Buddhist quality of right concentration. I don't know if you still recall when we talk about the, the Eightfold Path. The Eightfold Path, Number, number seven is Samma Sati and Samma Samadhi, right? Number seven, Samma Sati means uh, right mindfulness and Samma Samadhi means right concentration. So when the Buddha explains what he means by right mindfulness, he points to Sati Patthana, which is cultivate Sati to body, feeling, mind, and my object. But when it comes to right concentration, the Buddha points to the word Jhana. So you can go back to take a look what we have learned when we talk about the, the Eightfold Path. So when you study, again, uh, the teaching of the Buddha, you need to be able to connect the dot. 
okay reflect back and forth try to connect the dot it help you to understand the whole picture and practice the dhamma more effectively and this is the meaning of the jhana basically the jhana is the high concentration of meditation that the mind perfectly still not move okay feeling bliss feeling joy in that sense and this is what i like to emphasize one more time before we move on okay we will not spend a lot of time in the in the jhana section because again it's advanced it's, uh, it's time consuming it could be another topic there is no part of the body that not spread with rapture or pity and bliss or sukha born of seclusion that means your happiness did not come from the sense pleasure world born of seclusion that means you seclude yourself from those five hindrances your mind is free by itself it stays still by itself it stay concentrate fully with joy and happiness that's the nature of the jhana uh, there are two level of jhana the first four level is called material jhana rupa jhana and the another four is called immaterial jhana or arupa jhana just hear the term don't worry about the detail because these are another big topic in buddhist meditation practice now you get to know the term jhana now you get to kind of see the picture or the idea of what jhana look like but we may not you know explore in detail yet okay of each particular jhana there are eight of them the first four is called rupa jhana or material jhana and the second four second half is called immaterial jhana or arupa jhana okay it's a new term today it's a lot today so again take your time jot it down reflect it back okay and come back with question later on so the jhana sometimes we call is is the tool to burn burn up burn up what to burn up the hindrances something that's stopping you from serenity and insight from advanced meditation or at from a perfect equanimity or perfect concentration of the mind and that's the nature of the, the jhana we take care of hindrances and now the next step the buddha after he introduced the next step which is the jhana and this is the most difficult step that the buddha saved for the last okay when student have come this far past the past the jhana level he will introduce this level okay and it's called the three higher knowledge or wisdom but before we get there there are something that we need to understand first because in this particular step the buddha mentioned the term samadhi here samadhi when their mind has become immersed in samadhi like this the mind will be like this like what purifying bright flawless rid of corruption or no hindrances no defilement flexible workable steady and imperturbable it doesn't get agitated the mind feeling very peace very pure very calm very bright very flexible very steady and very workable the mind is ready ready for what ready to go deeper to acquire the highest wisdom when when, when someone have gone to this meditation journey this is it this is the last step there are three things will be happening after this point and the first thing is they recollect many kind of what of the past life with features and detail you have ability to recall your own past life it's called bukhe niwasa nusati jana jana mean knowledge not jana jana is concentration right but jana very similar but they're not the same jana mean knowledge the first knowledge or wisdom that will arrive this is the first one you have ability to access the knowledge that help you to be able to recall your own past life because your mind is so ready pure bright clear no defilement then you can go deeper into your own mind and recall the previous life of your own life and the second step they extend toward knowledge of the death and rebirth of sentient being chuttu papatiyana that mean you have ability or you have knowledge that help you to be able to recall or observe the previous life of someone else with all being that's the second wisdom or second higher knowledge and the third the third knowledge is called they extend it toward the knowledge of ending ending of what ending of defilement is called aswakhaya yana 
that means the yana or the knowledge that help you to purify your mind fully, get rid of all defilement in your mind. You see, the teaching of the Buddha is deep. So this particular two step, the last two step, that's why I call it advanced step. The Buddha usually don't teach everyone. When the student is ready, then he introduce the next step. So that means in this particular teaching, the Buddha give the teaching to the monk who were ready for the next step. So he introduced the concept of jhana. He introduced the concept of the three higher knowledge to the monk. Then the monk can practice and can be achieved. But for us here, uh, it's our job to get to know everything first, right? Whether you still don't understand, it's okay. You may have doubt, it's okay. This is good. This is the beauty of the teaching. The Buddha did not say, you must believe what I said. You must believe what I share with you. You must believe what I teach. No, the Buddha never said that. The Buddha wants us to reflect on his teaching and put into practice and realize it by yourself. Have a direct experience from yourself with the teaching. Then you will understand by yourself. When you practice, you know. When you don't practice, you don't know. We, we may keep talking about meditation, about hindrances, but if you don't meditate, what you learn is useless. But when you go back to meditate, you start understanding, oh, okay, falling asleep, wandering thought, sense pleasure, it's always come when you meditate. And these are something Buddha mentioned a long time ago. And he also gave us the tool or the technique to deal with them as well. So our job is, again, okay, we learn hindrances, Tonight, when I meditate, I will pay attention what kind of hindrances will show up and how can I deal with that. And that's the idea. Here in Buddhist meditation, I think this is good information for you to know. So I put together uh, to share with you to save you time. Buddhist meditation, there are two levels. The first one is called Samatha. Samatha is a Pali, translate to concentration. And the second one called Vipassana or inside meditation. Samatha concentration, Samatha and Samadhi is the same. So the word Samatha and the word Samadhi, they are synonymous. Samadhi means concentration, Samatha means concentration, means stillness, something stays still. And the goal of Samatha or the goal of calming meditation or concentration meditation, there are many techniques. We're talking about at least 40 techniques mentioned in Visuddhimakkha, uh, composed by the monks named Puttakosa Jan. And the goal of those techniques, whatever technique that practice in that 40 technique, the goal is to achieve the one-pointed mind so the mind becomes completely still. We call one-pointed mind or the unification of mind. That means five hindrances will be removed at the end of that practice. And then the outcome would be the jhana or the state of perfect equanimity and awareness. You will not fall asleep, you will not get agitated, you will feel bliss and joy when you meditate throughout your body, from the top of your head all the way down to the tip of your toe. And that's the outcome of samatha or concentration or calming meditation. And the second level of meditation is called vipassana or inside meditation. The goal of vipassana is to help us to realize our, the nature of our own mind or right understanding, which is wisdom. Right wisdom, right understanding. To remove ignorance, to remove mental impurity completely from the mind. And the outcome of vipassana is the jhana. Okay, don't get confused. Jhana and jhana, pronounced similar. Okay, uh, the, the vocabulary also written in a very similar, but they're not the same and they pronounce slightly different. Chan, chan or jhana is concentration, but jhana or jhana is liberation. The mind will be fully liberated from defilement. The mind is fully pure, fully bright, and flexible and workable. And that is why in this state of mind, the mind can penetrate deeper and deeper, okay? more and more refined. So that's why you have this kind of, you have access to these three kind of higher knowledge. And Samadhi usually, you know, translate in English as meditation. <laughs> Uh, now you become a monk, you practice meditation, you should know deeper than the lay people know. Okay? When we talk about meditation, meditation is not just meditation. Okay? There, are, uh, there are much deeper meaning than that. Okay? Not just sit and close our eyes. 
It's about concentration. The meaning that mentioned in the Visuddhimakkha is concentration, one pointed of mind, or unification of mind. This is the classic meaning of the word meditation or the word samadhi. There are three kind of meditation level. The first one is called momentary concentration or khanika samadhi, temporarily. Just like when we're cooking, when we're driving, when we're taking shower, everybody has a certain level of concentration. If we don't have concentration, we cannot do anything. Right? We cannot drive, we cannot read the book because your mind is everywhere. So we have already, this is by nature, we have temporary concentration. But when someone practices meditation, we are looking to achieve something higher than this, not just temporary meditation, not just temporary meditation. We're looking for something called excess concentration or upachara samadhi, upachara samadhi or excess concentration. This concentration almost, almost arrive at the jhana. Almost, not there yet. Almost. Jhana is perfectly still, right? Perfectly concentrated. But excess concentration is almost there, but not yet. And the last level is called apana samadhi or attain concentration. Sometimes we call absorb. Attainment concentration or absorption. Attainment concentration or absorption concentration. There are three levels. So you have been practicing meditation for quite some time. You may, you may be asking yourself, where am I going? Okay, how far can I go in this meditation journey? This is how far you can go. You may be surpassed the first level already, temporary concentration here and there. But now, can you move yourself further, aim to achieve something further than that, to have an excess concentration? That means you're fully aware, you're fully mindful of what you do. Every single activity that you do in front of you, you 100% with that activity that help you to lay down to master yourself to the second level of concentration which is called excess concentration. When you close your eye 30 minutes, you know that your mind stays with you like 90%, almost 90%, 95% all the time, every session. This is a good sign. Oppositely, when you sit one hour, you know that your mind only stays with you 5% all the time. Another 95% it stay outside. This is not a good sign. That means you have a lot of work to do. You need to make a lot of effort to come back, to stay still, and to make sure that your mind stays at peace longer than that. And eventually, you'll be able to deal with those five hindrances more comfortable, and your mind can be still much longer. Almost, okay, I think two more. <laughs> uh, the end of this lecture already about the Mahasapura Sutra, the Mashimanikaya number 39. It talk about what make good monks, right? The Buddha laid out like the whole picture of how how he wants to train the monks and how the monks should train himself. So start from Hiri Otapa, right? And move to the second step, which is purity of body, speech, and thought. And move on to the pure in livelihood. Okay, control the sense door. And then moderation in eating. Okay, the first five steps, understandable. And then after, after you're ready, okay, physically, verbally, the Buddha introduced you to something more advanced. Start from practice wakefulness. Don't be lazy, guys. Just go meditate day and night. Never give up. Find yourself a secluded place. Practice meditation, right? Uh, practice mindfulness and awareness. When you eat, when you walk, okay, the moment you wake up until the moment you go to bed, you are mindful with everything you do. So you cultivate that. And then abandon five hindrances. You go find the place, sit down and meditate. Remove five hindrances. Then you will arrive at something called the four jhana. Start from the four, but there are eight jhana. But in this text, it's mentioned only four jhana, uh, which is the advanced meditation, which is the high level of concentration in your meditation practice. It's called the jhana. And after that, okay, you master yourself, you understand the jhana in and out. Every time you close your eye, you might come back 100%, stay there, perfectly pure, perfectly concentrated. Then you are ready for the advanced level, which is the three knowledge. Then you have ability to access, to penetrate deeper into your mind, okay? be able to uh, recall your previous life, be able to recall someone's previous life, and be able to remove the hindrances or the defilement out of your mind completely. So these are the 10 steps. But I mentioned right from for you many times that when we summarize the teaching of the Buddha, the framework that the Buddha gave the monk to train themselves from day one that he ordained until the day that he realized Nibbana. 
under this framework, number one, sila, number two, samadhi, and number three is panya. Sila is morality or ethical part. The monk should observe precept, right? Verbally, physically, pure and calm. And then the monk is ready to train the mind, develop the quality of the mind, to be concentrated, to be focused. And then the monk is ready to acquire the higher wisdom after these two things have been developed. So how can we relate related to this from what we just learned? These are the sila, purity of body, speech, okay, livelihood, sense control, and moderate anything. It's about physical part and how we make a living as a good monk. It falls under the heading of sila or ethical part. The second one is the samadhi, okay, or you can call meditation or concentration, right? This is one, concentration. And what about the panya or the third one, which is wisdom, right? Here is the wisdom. This wisdom helps us to understand the law of nature, the law of karma, by being able to reflect or recall our previous life, recall someone's previous life, and ability to remove all the defilement from our mind. Okay, and this one deals with vipassana or insight meditation, which we have not talked about it yet. But today you see the picture. So reading one sutra, like I said, is not enough. There are many details of each particular item that you see on this slide. So our job is to get to know all of them, understand them, so we can put every single one of them into practice correctly and properly. It's a journey. The day one you ordain is a journey of self-development. Intensively, not relaxingly. Okay, The monk ordain because he sees the danger in the cycle of existence. That's why people ordain back then. So they want to shorten their life. Uh, lifetime to break free the cycle of existence. So they got themselves ordained and from day one that they ordained, they start following the teaching of the Buddha wholeheartedly. Observe precept, practice meditation, and study Dhamma, study the theoretical part, and also uh, meditation. Put everything he learned into meditation practice. Then his mind can be free from defilement, he can be happy. Okay, uh, if, you, if you put the Dhamma or the teaching of the Buddha into your practice correctly. You can be happy on a daily basis, every single day. In Buddhism, happiness is both mean and ends. It's not just the destination. It means the journey, the journey of happiness. Because this is the journey of peace and joy, the journey of non-violence, the journey of loving kindness. Okay, every day we share loving kindness, we meditate. Okay, we observe precept. It should be the journey of good life, the journey of peaceful life. Same thing with the lay people. They can practice the similar thing by being ethical father, ethical wife, husband and wife and kids, practice meditation, develop the quality of the mind, and find time to access to the teaching of the Buddha, okay, whatever they need to be uh, knowing, like uh, how to be a good father, how to be a good boss, how to take care of the family and things like that. There are many levels of the teaching of the Buddha that are available. The thing is, not many people, you know, pay attention and seriously study the teaching and put the teaching of the Buddha into practice. And that is why there are many problems in the society nowadays, as we notice you know, from the newspaper and from the social media. Okay, corruption, violence, you know, taking advantage from each other. Okay, uh, that's, that's the nature of the defilement that takes control of the human mind. It's the driving force uh, behind of each unwholesome behavior. Okay? It's the manifestation of the corrupted mind. Just to recap, okay, we have learned the Sutra, Maha Asapura Sutra and Kanaka Mokalana Sutra, the teaching of the Buddha that laid out the framework to train the monks, not just the new monk. Okay, this is for every monk. They should train themselves okay, in this manner from step number one all the way up to step number ten until he realized Nibbana so he can be at peace. To keep it short, again, it falls into this category. Sila, Samadhi, and Panya. But if we expand them out, we see the 10 step. Start from Hiri Otapa. Sense control, moderation in eating, okay, uh, mindfulness, practice wakefulness, all the way up to the jhana, and then the three knowledge. Upeniwa Sanusti Yan, Jutupapata Yan, and then Asawakaya Yan. Is there any questions, comment, or suggestion? something you want to ask, something you want to share. You can reflect on what you learn. I know that there are a lot of information today and there are a lot of new vocabulary as well. 
And this is the nature of uh, study Buddhist text. Like I said, it's not uh, it's not fun because there's no picture, there's no nothing. It's just purely text. And our job is to go sentence by sentence, line by line. You cannot skip it and try to understand the meaning behind it. And that's why it makes Buddhist text study is quite challenging for many many people, monk and the lay people. But we have no choice. Okay, as a, as a student of the Buddha, we ordained for this. So. Our job is to study what the Buddha teach, try to understand it, and put everything we learn into action. That's the idea. So this is the journey, not just one time. We will be meeting again and learning different sutra with each other again. So be prepared for that. Please go back and reflect on what we learn. So rejoice in everyone's merit. Okay? Please have a good meditation, have a good help, and successful in your monastic journey.